uh, school population, you know, from the elementary up to the middle, and certainly to the high school as well. Um, there's one additional high school teacher, five at the middle school, and two special education teachers that are planned in those eight positions. And I might add that um, that's just in the first year. The second year of the override, if it were to pass, we would be addressing uh, the enrollment more at the high school level and adding positions at the high school level. But I think that, uh, and again, we can't overlook the, uh, the capital expenditure, too, because the textbooks are badly needed in a number of subject areas at both the high school and the middle school level. Mm -hmm. I guess getting back to the, the class size and the additional teachers, can you talk a little bit about the school committee targets for class size and why the school committee feels that's important to set those targets? Yeah, I mean, the target, and we, we use the number at the elementary school level, pretty much from K through 5, is about 22 students. Now, that doesn't mean it can't vary from a little bit more or a little bit less. And it's sometimes hard to balance them out right out of 22 because of districting uh, issues. But that's that, we think, is the... Um, uh, the, the best level at the elementary school. And then certainly at the middle school and the high school, um, I think mid-20s are, are, is certainly our target. And right now we're exceeding 30 students in many of those classes. Um, and, and they're core subjects, too. I mean, they're not just electives, but uh, the core subjects uh, at the middle school in particular are over, over 30 students in many classes. What kind of effects does the school department see from large class sizes? Well, I, I think, um, you know, again, and, and this is more of a subjective analysis by us. I mean, we haven't certainly sat down and analyzed this. But we're starting to see some slippage in the MCAS scores. We're starting to see, um, and we've seen for a while now, uh, SAT scores that aren't at the level that we'd like to see them at. Uh, and we also think that... Um, there may be some disciplinary issues as well. I mean, at the middle school, for example, they're finding it's it, more problems than they have in the past. Um, and I think part of it is because of the size of the classes and, and the number of kids at the school. So um, I, I think the, the test results are a concern to us. And, um, and, and part of it, I believe, is because of the increased class size. One of the issues that's come up and comes up repeatedly, both in general government for the schools, are um, contracts, employee contracts. And I know last year was particularly contentious with the teacher's contract. And as much as you'd like to forget it, um, can you talk a little bit about those negotiations and, and how you what you did in the negotiations helps to control expense for the yeah, future? I mean, Bob's talked about fixed costs. And one of the fixed costs that we've had to deal with over the years are some uh, provisions of the teacher's contract that I think um, at this point were somewhat antiquated. <coughs> In particular, there were retirement benefits to teachers above and beyond their, uh, the retirement benefits they earned through the, the Mass Teachers Association, et cetera. And those, those retirement benefits were provided and somewhat unique to the town of North Reading. It included early retirement incentives and it also included sick leave buyback, which was costing the town hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, sometimes from anywhere from $250,000 to $400,000 a year. Um, our goal when we started the negotiations, and I think we're wrapping up the second year of the teacher's contract, and we have a four-year contract, which I think is beneficial to the town as well. But um, some of those provisions for the early retirement incentive and the uh, sick leave buyback, it was our goal to try to reduce those and roll those back. And I don't think it's ever easy to do that with collective bargaining agreements. Um, it took us 13 months to get there. And essentially, the trade-off was trying to bring the salary structure for our teachers uh, to, to a competitive level with uh, communities that we compare ourselves to. We were able to do that, but in exchange for that, we, s we received significant reductions in those retirement benefits. And I think in the long run, it's going to save the town hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, we rolled back the early retirement incentive uh, based 50 percent. Uh, they were, the teachers would receive 40 percent of their uh, final year's pay is an early retirement incentive if they retired by age 56, for example. Uh, we've now rolled that back to 20 percent. The sick leave buyback, they will receive 33 percent of um, um, their accrued sick leave over the, the entire life of their, their tenure at, at North Reading. And we rolled that back uh, essentially now to 20 percent. So there's been some significant changes that are going to save a lot of money in the long run. Uh, and I think that uh, the, certainly the town will benefit. And Bob spoke about those fixed costs that come off the top. But just to be clear, aside from the, those important changes for the long run, for the short run, the goal of the teacher's contract that you fulfilled was just simply to keep the teacher's salary competitive. 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 That, not, was, not that was the key. And if you look at the contract, after we brought them to what we considered a competitive level, the annual increases over that four-year period are modest. I mean, I think it's 2%. It averages 2% or a little less than 2% over that four-year period. 
Um, so uh, again, I think that um, uh, it, it was a difficult task, but I think in the end, the teachers benefited from the competitive salary level and the town benefited from the reduced benefits. Great, thank you, Jerry. Um, I guess while we're talking about cost control on the school department side, I'd like to turn to Carl Nelson, our uh, business manager. And I know that you on the expense side do a lot of things. While that's a smaller part of the budget, you do, uh, do, do a lot to try to control expenses. Can you talk about those? Sure, ones? thank you. I think we do. I think uh, it's instructive to understand at the outset that the expense side of the school budget is 21%. So um, it's, it's a challenge to impact the overall budget uh, when you're only dealing with that 21% slice of the pie. But to begin with, uh, at the nitty gritty level, uh, we exercise what I'd like to think are pretty stringent financial controls over the purchasing process. Um, we have a purchase order system and an incumbent system that's not worth going into in, in dire detail, but I think it's important to reassure the public that the financial controls are in place so that uh, proper uh, accounting uh, occurs. Um, as we begin to develop each year's expense budget, we begin with developing uh, school committee budget goals. Um, and we develop a process whereby our spending plan uh, stems from what those budget goals are each year. So it, it, it lends some substance and some continuity to the process. Um, and then as we begin to uh, approach each fiscal budget year, we uh, are aggressive in our pursuit of uh, frugal spending patterns. Uh, to give you a couple examples of what we do is um, we have joined about a half dozen spending consortiums where we uh, uh, partner with many other area school districts so that the uh, advantages of uh, volume purchasing uh, become apparent to us as we move forward. Um, specifically, we are involved in uh, uh, spending consortiums in the areas of natural gas, uh, paper and supplies, uh, our, our bus transportation program, our food service contract. We even bid out our, our contractors. When we hire plumbers and electricians and tradespeople to come into the school department to provide uh, work that we can't do on our own, we literally have bid that and we exercise our uh, state contract pricing so that we're able to uh, exercise as many efficiencies as we possibly can. And then lastly, uh, that 21% of the budget that constitutes expenses um, is largely fixed costs. And the biggest fixed cost that is contained within that area is energy costs. Um, and in the past four or five years, we've been very aggressive in trying to bring those costs down. Uh, members of the school committee can comment on how chilly it is on Monday evenings when we meet in the middle school. But we not only uh, have clock thermostats uh, throughout all of our buildings where we're able to do setbacks at night and, and make sure that our, our uh, boilers aren't burning when we're not there, but we're also in the midst now of installing uh, uh, kind of a computerized temperature control system whereby we can monitor the, uh, the activity of the heating systems in all five buildings externally. So that, for example, if we had a snow day and normally the temperature would be on that day, we can now turn the, the thermostats down. So uh, we are very aggressive in our pursuit of trying to uh, make that school dollar go as far as we can. Great. And I guess I'd like to briefly, Carl, ask you about per pupil costs when you talk about making the school dollar go as far. Can you just talk a little bit about how per pupil costs, which are reported from the Department of Education, are calculated and verified? Sure, thank you. Uh, per pupil spending, uh, the definition I would use, it is, it is a statewide measure of how much each school district spends. Um, and the manner in which it is, it's important to understand how it's calculated. Um, uh, to begin, the Department of Education provides uh, a questionnaire, if you will, that is literally uh, several thousand rows. Uh, of information that we have to collect. We, are, we break our spending down by grade, by school, by type of service. Um, in order to make sure we uh, get the full picture, um, information is also collected from municipal government. Uh, I, I think we all understand that every uh, municipality spends in a slightly different fashion. For example, in North Reading, we uh, want to make sure that the costs that are borne by general government in behalf of the schools are also collected in this process. Such items as retirement, uh, health insurance, and many others are paid for and subsumed within the municipal town government. And 
So the end of year report, which collects all this, this information, um, carefully collects the entire picture from both school and town. Um, once all of the information has been collected, um, an outside auditor, uh, an independent auditor, uh, comes in and looks at this material. Um, that auditor is uh, selected by the town's finance director and I believe approved by the selectmen so that it, it truly is an independent review of the school department spending. Um, once the auditor completes uh, their investigation, uh, the DOE is able to publish the results um, so that uh, you can compare your spending against other communities uh, within the Commonwealth. Great. Thanks for that explanation. And that, that data is all about publicly available online? Yes, it is. Uh, it's available through the school department office or people can uh, get it from the Department of Education website directly. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Carl. Um, our last guest this evening, but certainly not least, is Mike Mestescusa from the Finance Committee. And the Finance Committee is an independent committee appointed by the moderator to do just what its name says, review the finances of the town. So with that, um, one area, Mike, that's been uh, hotly debated is the impact of health insurance increases over the past three, three years and how that's helped to get us to an override situation. Could you talk a little about that from FinCom's perspective? Sure. Um, historically, Health insurance and benefit costs are part of the fixed costs, which are shared costs of the town. Uh, we have, it's, I think the line item itself is the second largest line item, second only to the school department in town. Um, when the second largest line item in your budget increases in double digits every year, it's a structural deficit. And that's what we've had. We've had um, our health insurance, uh, we had budgeted on a preliminary basis a 15% increase because that's what we had been experiencing. Luckily, this year it came in at 11 percent and made things a little bit easier, a little bit, you know, shared some more, shared some more funding throughout the rest of the budget. But when the second largest line item in your budget increases at a rate of 11 percent and you can only increase your taxes at 2.5 percent, it's a structural deficit, and that's what we've incurred. Okay, great. Now, my understanding is that the majority of the Finance Committee supports of the two overrides the three-year override. Can you tell us why the Finance Committee has a preference for that? Well, we do support both overrides. Uh, we do support the one-year and the three-year override. We're going to need an override. If, we, if both overrides fail, we're going to need one next year. But the reason why we did support the three-year override was it, it really, I don't want to say it was our idea, but it was our idea. <laughs> in 2005, we passed an override that was intended to last three years. And in 07, we came back last year for the 07 budget, an override was proposed. and. I think the Finance Committee was the, the board or the committee to stand up and say, no, let's, let's have some, some integrity in the budget process and let's make this three-year override last three years. And we did. We took a step back, we tightened our belts, and we made some hard choices last year, and that got us to where we are today. In the meantime, we said what we should do on a prudent basis is, is come forward with a plan, a budget plan, a real plan, and do the hard work and make the hard decisions and make the hard estimates and, and project, make some projections and come up with a three-year plan that the town can really wrap their arms around and, and see, is this what we want to do? Um, the school committee and the board of selectmen made some hard decisions, made some choices, and mapped out <laughs> some plan for the town for the next three years. Public safety, class size, DPW, all the resources to the town that we need, all the, all the services that we've become accustomed to. How do we fund that for the next three years? And that's what the, the finance committee basically suggested. That's what the town, the board of selectmen, the TA, the school committee followed through with. And that's why we are here. That's why we're here today. So we, we couldn't help but support it because that, that's what we suggested everyone do. And that's where we are. Okay. As a follow-up to that, I'd like to ask our other panelists, and then I'll come back with another question for mm -hmm. you, Mike. Is three-year planning, I guess, to either Greg or Bob and then Jerry or Carl, how does three-year planning help benefit both general government and the school department? Um, do you want to start with that? Sure. Okay. I mean, I, I think... Mike uh, made some good points. That I want to emphasize that you know the reduction of 10 positions in the school department and the increase in class size and the reduction of $257,000 from our small capital budget that won't allow us to buy textbooks that we need. Some people may say, hey, you can get by with that. But the, the problem is that's just the beginning, OK? Because there's, it's, it's not a one-year problem for us. The, Mike said structural deficit, and that first came up a couple of months ago. Mike mentioned it. Steve O'Leary mentioned it in one of our meetings. The structural deficit doesn't allow us to catch up. So the 10 positions and the reduction in the, the, the uh, small cap is just the beginning. I think it's a slippery slope from there. It doesn't get better. It only gets worse. 
And that's what's going to happen if we don't provide some long-term planning 